Futurism and cooking, what a good fit. Great speech. I'm a hobby cook myself, so I totally get what you... I don't just have ideas, I also actually make things, you know, that's rare. But uh, for my Brazilian, for the Brazilians here, I have a little snippet here. I want to talk first about what a futurist is. Many of you will be saying, what in the world is a futurist? I mean, it sounds like a mad mission. Uh, in fact, it is. But is it about flying, air, flying cars or, or what is it about, right? So how can you even know the future? So I'm not a futurist like Ray Kurzweil or Alvin Toffler. I wish I could be. I'm much more about the present. So I was actually thinking about calling myself a presentist. But that's another meaning, so it's taken. So in a nutshell, this is what I do for my clients. I develop ideas. I look at the next three to five years and I bring those ideas into my clients. I run a company called The Futures Agency. It's a lot like agents for the future. That's sort of the concept, uh, if that's even feasible. And my main mission is to do this, which is why I really enjoyed this conference. It's been fabulous, doing a lot of listening rather than talking, which is unusual for me, I have to admit. But that's sort of, you know, that's my dude. I'll come to that later. So I'm originally a musician and producer. I made about 20 records. I played in uh, Caesar's Palace in Lake Tahoe. I went to Berkeley College. I had a good time as a musician. But uh, then I switched to doing stuff on the internet, and before I knew it, I became a futurist by virtue of my clients telling me that I was one. I, I didn't know what it was, so uh, very much like you. And just to give a sort of a highlight of, of my life, you know, I do about 100 gigs a year speaking to companies and conferences. This is one of the worst and the best gigs i ever done. This is Tehran. Uh, I'm speaking in front of the mullahs. Here's me. And you, can, you may guess who this is. I'm not going to comment, but you can guess who that is in the picture, you know, which is, of course, everywhere in Iran, this picture. And my topic of my speech is change. <laughs> I, of my speech, so that's quite an ironic topic in Iran. But anyway, so I get to do some interesting stuff. Um, bottom line is, you know, we all grew up, if you're as old as I am, uh, you grew up in this system. Uh, this is the ego system, big companies, big banks, big record labels, big publishers, big, big broadcasters, big taxes, big government. All of a sudden, we are now switching to this kind of system. Right? We're switching to a system where all of a sudden we are actually getting more power as consumers, as users. Right? We're not, of course, doing away with the big system, not yet. Right? So it's a little bit like, you know, they're still over here. Right? But we have gathered a lot of cloud. You know, we can go to TripAdvisor and complain about hotels. We can check flight schedules on kayak. You know, we have more power every single day. And in many cases, that's kind of frightening, in fact, if you look at Facebook. But this paradigm, for example, of, of broadcasting and you know, of being a central entity, that's been with us for a long time. Right? So big television station, mass media, and so on. And now we're adding this. This is sort of the connected economy. Right? And it's not actually taking the other one over. It's sort of coming in addition. So Facebook, for example, is the biggest broadcaster in the world, 550 million users. But what are they broadcasting? They're broadcasting us to each other. Not regular television or film quite yet, but they will eventually, right? So they're doing this, and the BBC is doing this, right? So we have both at the same time. We're creating a new ecosystem, an ecosystem of the previously unconnected, you know, the, the network, NBC, CBS, and the network, which is us, coming together sort of in this new ecosystem that I want to talk about in this speech. We're having a bit of a war of the worlds, right, of the disconnected and the connected. And you can't really read this quote, but it's a CEO of Telefonica saying, one of the biggest phone companies in the world, saying that he wants to charge Google for internet access. He wants Google to pay because so many people are Googling now on the mobile phone, creating network load. He wants to get paid for that. And then we have our friend Rupert Murdoch saying that, well, this is his son actually saying that whatever you are talking about, when people cut and paste news content, it's theft, it's stealing, end of story. So you have this completely, the world view of saying this is all, that's not a good idea. You have Viacom suing YouTube, right? In the end, you have this complete war of ideas, how this can actually work together. And then we have this which I perceive sort of be the only way forward, not going to Africa, but creating something together, creating an ecosystem. The CEO of, Google, uh, CEO of Google has said many times he sees the purpose of what he does to create an ecosystem that has mutual power and mutual appreciation. You may not believe it, but I think he's trying hard, right? But this is the model for the future, is collaboration. Now, 
Many times I speak to really hardcore business audiences, you know, CEOs of big companies, and they're saying, what in the world are you talking about? You've lived in California for too long. This is like some sort of ideology or something. Uh, but it's not. This is not a hippie geek pipe dream, you know, even though I did live in California. I think it's the key to the future. The key to the future is collaboration in, an, in a system of win-win scenarios. The music industry can't possibly survive without the internet service providers, the ISPs and telcos. Right? There has to be a system that generates money in a new way. That, to me, is the key of how this works. Give you some examples. The ego system, MTV, not to say it's bad, I'm just saying it's an analysis, right? Not to say that MTV is bad, it's good, but it's based on their opinion. YouTube is based on our opinion. Right? So it's an ecosystem. Right? We say what the program of YouTube is. The car industry, as opposed to local motors, which we heard about yesterday. Great talk, same idea. Again, the music industry is saying, if there's a website without a license, says the IFPI, it's a big problem for us. The BBC says, use our stuff to build your stuff. There's an API, you can suck off the whole thing of the BBC and build your own website, or The Guardian. Right? You can suck off all the content of The Guardian, make a new website in China, using all this stuff for free. Rupert Murdoch's newspaper, The Times, one pound now to get access. The Huffington Post says, bring all your buddies, which we start a social community in the Huffington Post. They have now more traffic than CNN. So you can see examples for how we're going from the ego system, from the, you know, it's about my money, my audience, to an ecosystem. Uh, not has much to do with food, but it's a sort of similar scenario. So we're seeing the shift to hyper-connected and interdependent. What that means is that we can't make money if the other guys don't make money. We can't do what Disney has done, which is to create a complete empire that money always comes back to us one way or the other. And that's not a bad thing, it just it worked great for a while for them. Right? But now we have to actually make sure everybody else makes money as well. And then we do what Local Motors does. We go from not invented here to proudly found elsewhere. Everything I'm telling you today pretty much is proudly found elsewhere. The smartest stuff I find on the web, Twitter, SlideShare, my, my blog feeds, you guys probably tweeting me sometimes. We're going from this shift in the minds of people who run companies from return on investment to return on engagement. Not wondering so much how much money do I spend to acquire a customer, how much they're going to give back to me, how can I lock them up or target them, all that military language. Right? Now we're talking about return on engagement. Close to open, I'll explain a little bit later, control to trust and fear to confidence. If you look at the music industry and the film industry and the digital economy bill, it's a work of fear. Uh, essentially saying, okay, if this happens, we'll never make movies again because we don't get paid. Telling every musician that they have to go along with this because they won't get paid unless we stop downloading, right? That's just a product of fear. How is that going to get us to the next iteration of this model? We need engagement, we need confidence. In Germany, GEMA, which is the German author society, wants 12 cents for each song that is being played on YouTube as a video. Right? Because that's what they used to have you know, 20 years ago for on-demand performances. In China, Google has licensed music and shares the money from the free downloads with the record companies. Right? So that's, again, two different models here. And of course, we have Apple. Right? All of us are obviously happy Apple users and cultists, I could say. I love Apple, but, you know, iTunes essentially is saying, okay, everything you do is within our control. That, that's the iPad. I'm happy with that as a user, but in general, we have to say that probably in the long run can't work, you know, this idea of great machines that do great things, but just for them. I think this is a uh, good example, but probably the last one. <coughs> if you want to keep a closed shop like Apple, you have to be damn good. You have to be as good as he is. And that's very few of us. So it can work, but most of the time it won't. You may recognize this slide. That's the music business. <laughs> I, I'm saying that because I worked in the music business for a long time. I wrote a book called The Future of Music. Now it's the past of music. But in any case, uh, the industry has shrunk 65% in 10 years. 
So congratulations to the music industry leaders with a policy of fear and control. They've made lots of money. But I didn't find this myself, didn't make this up myself, but I say in the past, power was about what you can control. In the future, power is about what you can unleash, what you can create at a moment's notice. Twitter, Facebook, and so on, using those kind of tools, but power is what you can unleash. If EMI would take that motto and put it into practice, they would gain. I'm certain of it. I tried, but of course, they weren't listening. This is their speech, right? The Record Industry Association, the IFPI, in the UK saying, protecting intellectual property is key to growing the business. Well, none of us would mind protection of intellectual property. Yeah? But is that the key to growth? How can protection be key to growth? That's sort of like saying, you know, it's, it's, it, it does, it's not a very good fit. Now, if we put this, what Tim O'Reilly is saying, he's saying obscurity is a bigger problem for authors than piracy. I can personally attest to this, having made 20 records. Obscurity, they're all fairly obscure and written four <laughs> books, right? Obscurity is a bigger problem than piracy. Our problem is not that people want to download our stuff without paying. Our problem is that they don't even know us. Right? And then there's no mechanism to pay. So we have to turn this around. We have to think of this a little bit differently. The Music Publishers Association of America ran a campaign last year, or the year before, saying who is protecting your rights? Of course, that question is very present in Britain, the current discussion of file sharing and so on. I think it's barking up the wrong tree. Right? It's the wrong question. The question isn't who, who's protecting our rights, but how do we get lots of people to use it and what's the mechanism to monetize? It's not protection, it's engagement. Now with the digital economy bill, and as you know, you know 28,000 people have been sued for downloading music. Uh, many, many more are being sued and the iPad is next, right? We're going to see a lot of discussion. This is the ecosystem, the ecosystem saying, okay, we'll lock you up if you do the wrong thing on the internet. First music, then PDFs, motion pictures, JPEGs, Murdoch's blog, blog posts, whatever it is, right? You'll get kicked off because you didn't do the right thing. I mean, think about that. We'll be ending up in China very soon if we go in this direction. Benjamin Franklin summed it up, not any better than I could. He said, those who can give up essential liberty to obtain a little temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety. I think that's something we have to face. We have to face the fact that we can't do this without giving up a lot of things that we really like. So the alternative is to build a system that works, not one, not one that locks. Which brought me yesterday, uh, you know, searching my, in, my, in my archive, you know, this is Hugh McLeod, he's a great, uh, a great cartoonist, right? He's saying, you know, this is what a walled garden looks like, right? You want to live in this world where everybody who is inside makes money, everybody else can go screw themselves, right? That's the world we lived in. If that's the world of the internet in the future, I don't want to be there. Right? We have to get out of this walled garden. We don't need more walled gardens, we need less. We need good gardens, you know, talking about cooking. Right? They create good food, but for everyone, not just for one person, for one company. So I'm proposing, this is a mock-up, I'm proposing a Facebook world leaders group, you know, where we have uh, Gaddafi and Hugo Chavez, you know, talking about how they get on. You know, we should do something like this, you know. This is obviously mock, you know, it wasn't my idea, but this is the kind of stuff you find on the internet, you know. So here's Mark Zuckerberg from Facebook, right? And he says, Facebook is the most powerful distribution network, I mean, distribution network, he's not talking about social network, right? Distribution network. Facebook is a broadcast and the most powerful mechanism has been created in a generation. 10.7 billion minutes spent on Facebook every single day. Not of us here, because we can't get on. But, you know, in general, that's how it works. So Facebook is starting to spin, and I think basically we have to face the fact, talking about Facebook, ecosystems are complicated. Openness is hard. Permanent beta, see Google, can be stressful. Democracy is sometimes work. If we want to live in an ecosystem, and we really have no choice, we have to do the work. It's a lot easier to live in a tyranny. Look at Apple. We don't have to decide, we just buy. Right? So, in general, I think that's something we have to face. Ecosystems will be requiring work from us, and when we talk about ecosystem, we can't get around the fact that most of this will not happen in England or Germany or in the US. It will happen in those 
orange and red areas in the so-called developing countries. I do some work in Brazil. That's here, just in case you didn't know. Okay. What's happening in Brazil now, all of a sudden in Brazil, this idea, which was expressed in my first book, Music Like Water, stolen from David Bowie, by the way, from an interview. Right? This is actually happening in China and in Brazil. In Brazil, it's being discussed that you can pay 150 a month to get the right to download stream anything you want as a music consumer. And even better, you don't actually pay. You bump it off to the advertisers. So you solve the piracy problem by the government saying, this is the deal, like radio. It can't be illegal if 95% of the population is doing it. That's the alternative to our digital economy bill. So the idea of going from a copyright, essentially, uh, to a usage right, that doesn't deflate copyright. It just makes, makes it available. Right? It's an expansion, or maybe it's a, uh, you could say, an exception in a way, like radio. So that's what we're going to see, I think, in the future. We're going from a copy economy to an access economy. This is good news for everyone, except for those that sold hundreds of millions of copies. Right? Because obviously, the more we access, the more we cut away from the, hit, from the hits. Right? So in music terms, the five people who made a killing with music, they're going to probably sell a little bit less, including U2 and Bono and you know, who has spoken out against the flat rate and those kind of things, right? So that's basically what's happening. All content is becoming a click. All books, all music, all films. And we have to create a new logic. I spoke at an event a few years ago in Vienna called the uh, Creative it was Arts Electronica. And basically what we came up with is that we need a new social contract of how we deal with creation and who gets paid with what. We can't just take the stuff from the past and throw it on top of this. Now, I do a lot of work in branding and marketing as well. And we have the same issue. Marketing is just one step behind the media business. Same disruption from the ecosystem to the ecosystem. Branding used to be this, you know, just get your stamp out in the consumer and they'll buy anything once they heard it 10 times. Now it's this. The paradigm of Twitter, whether it's Twitter actually or not, makes no difference. But the paradigm is one of following, of friendship, right? of connecting, of liking, you could say. Right? That's so much harder than to say, you're going to see my ad 10 times, and you'll just end up remembering and buying my damn car anyway. Right? That's how it used to be, branding sort of top down. Right? So I think branding becomes banding, you know, going back to my music experience. Right? So you're essentially creating a band with your followers, yeah, with your users, with your consumers. And that is the power of the network that we, that we can use for this. Similar to this, you know, advertising on television, radio, news, as you know, of course, is declining everywhere. Right. So now the watering can that we used to use as marketers is no longer really working. We're skipping to a sprinkler system. The most efficient marketing is direct marketing now, very soon, on the mobile devices with opt-in mechanisms. When you drive by my shop, you get a message if you have opted in, you're interested in cooking, you'll get a bleep on your iPhone as you come in the vicinity. Right? That's the sprinkler system that we're going to see that's going to pay for a lot of content, $1 trillion in advertising money. Marshall McLuhan, the original futurist, you know, he said this very astutely, I think, 50 years ago. He says he, he's only talking about he, I'm sorry for you, but he talks about he, but he means everyone, people. Right? He says he wants a way of interrelating by which people feel that they are changed, that they're getting with it, they're getting involved, they are participating. That's really what it's all about. Even if participation only means clicking the like button or sending out a YouTube link or, or doing a rating or whatever it is, you don't have to write Wikipedia entries to participate. That goes with this slide. This is all we were concerned about in business for a long time. We want people to damn just buy the stuff, right? Just shut up and buy our stuff. Today, it's this first. It's getting some sort of fan, right? Getting a relationship with somebody who is going to say, you know, this is basically confronting us with this whole logic. We have to get fans first before we get customers. 